we're going to have a lot of fun. I think I say that every time, mostly because I'm the one who has the fun. And so hopefully you'll join in on my party. Um, I hope you come and you're ready to be equipped and encouraged and challenged to be able to share your faith without fear. Um, people tend to be uh, quite scared when it comes to sharing the gospel. I know I introduced myself during the uh, earlier session, but I just want to share a video with you to give you a better perspective about what it is um, I do when I'm not here. So let's play that video. People need to hear about God. Who will speak for Him? God wants you to tell them about Him. Are you ready? What would you need for you to give them the gospel? Knowing what to say and how to say it is important for sure. But what about the fear? Imagine Jesus using you to tell a complete stranger about him. How will they believe in him if they have not heard about him? Jesus can make you into the messenger that he's planned for you to become. Let us help you give the word to the people that you already know. Let us make you into the messenger that God wants you to be. We will meet you where you are and take you to where they are and watch God make you into the person he wants you to become. Excuse me guys, did you see my friend's presentation over here? I thought that would be helpful in encouraging you guys as far as what it is we actually do. And hopefully that was a, a blessing to you. Um, perhaps you have a different perspective on what you're expecting to happen today. Maybe you um, are scared of your own shadow when it comes to sharing the gospel. Um, I remember one time I was at Bible College down in West Virginia. Um, and I came home for Christmas, and it was, I had the family around, and I had, m most of my family are not saved. And when I came home, I remember my cousin, I was trying to share the gospel with him. And I had the scriptures open. I was very nervous, okay, just terrified as it gets. And um, I remember there was this pivotal moment where he said, you mean to tell me you trust in that book more than your own flesh and blood? And I remember just like, it was just like clear as day. <laughs> I could hear like a voice in my, in my mind, who are you going to stand for, you know? And I was like, I said, yes, you didn't die for my sin. You um, don't know the secrets of my heart. You don't know the wickedness that I've committed in my life. And you weren't willing to take my punishment for me. And I was very clear when I made that stance. Um, but... I just remember being absolutely terrified. I can tell you multiple times of being terrified. I remember uh, I mentioned this at the uh, men's breakfast. I remember when I attended LMC, Lake Michigan College, and I wanted a witness. I knew I was saved. I knew people needed to be saved. And I was quite convinced that some of my professors definitely weren't saved. And uh, I ended up typing this like 30-page thing on why Christianity is true. And I remember I was so bold that I made up a fake email. Well, I made up a new email account that I never used. And I put it on the paper so they could follow up if they had questions. And I put it underneath my professor's door. <laughs> and let's just say I never got an email. <laughs> and classes were quite interesting after that. But uh, I remember another time, uh, my logic professor... Um, he, he was comparing Jesus to Socrates, and he, and he just kept doing that. And I was like, are, are you a Christian? And he said, no, I'm a, I'm a Hindu. And I said, oh, and that's all I said. And I walked out like I didn't know what to say. So um, as far as the struggle of sharing your faith, trust me, I know what that's like. 
Uh, or perhaps you're coming from another perspective where maybe you envision sharing your faith to look a lot like this. Have you ever found yourself trying to force the gospel uh, on someone? <laughs> right? We go from one extreme to the other. You know that's what balance is, right? It's the thing we pass by as we go from one extreme to the other. You know, we tend to be either scared or we're really forceful. I remember um, different times in my life where I was a little too aggressive when it came to sharing the gospel. And perhaps you can relate to that. And um, I just want to share with you some tips and some things that might be encouraging to you that I think will help you when it comes to sharing your faith. And there's a verse that I'm going to continue to appeal to throughout our time together. And it's perhaps it's a verse you've committed to memory at some point in your life. I just had to double check I had the reference, right? It's been a few years since I uh, um, used this verse. But we're going to be looking at Proverbs 29.25. Proverbs 29.25. It says, The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. The fear of man brings a trap, a snare. But he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. And, you know, uh, to use a millennial line, uh, spoiler alert, essentially, until you become convinced of this, you won't come to a point where you're bold and compassionate enough to share the gospel with people you already know. Because until you really believe that being afraid of what other people will think, say, or do to you is a trap, and until you come to the point where you believe that if you trust that the Lord has your back and that his word will go forth in power, um, he won't exalt you um, in, in a sense of he won't make your way prosperous when it comes to sharing the gospel. In other words, so many people I know, as you can see, I don't like microphones, but uh, so many people I know, they're only willing to do what God wants them to do as long as it's within their comfort zone. As long as it feels good. Essentially, we worship how we feel more than what God wants us to uh, accomplish through us. You know, um, I believe Jack Wurtson from Word of Life used to say, uh, the best ability is availability. And my question to you today, this morning, is have you made yourself available to God to be used as a mouthpiece with people you already know, let alone the people you haven't got to know yet, because you're too afraid to. Because until someone's born again, they will die in their sins. The gospel is very clear. And so, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about fear. And I want to talk about um, just what it is and some things that we can think through in regards to that. If you recall, uh, in the garden, when God came to Adam and Eve after they ate the fruit... What was Adam and Eve doing at this point? Anybody remember? This is 3D. It's not a computer screen. Yeah? Huh? Hiding, hiding right? Yeah, they were hiding, and they were... <laughs> he said, well, you know, what are you doing hiding? And they're like, well, we heard you come in, and we recognized we were naked, so we hid ourselves, right? It's a, a Fear is something that's an immediate emotional and uh, thought process. It happens right in the moment. Um... There's also a godly fear, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom, uh, but fools de uh, despise wisdom and instruction. So there's, there's just the typical fear that we have. There's a godly fear. There's also a godly concern of circumstances, as our brother read this morning in regards to 2 Corinthians 11 with the Apostle Paul, where he said he had his concern for the uh, churches, and also in addition to that, he was concerned about robbers and such. Also, there's the ungodly fear of man, right? The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Proverbs 29, 25. I'm going to keep repeating that throughout this session in, a, in an attempt to help you to memorize that. Because I think um, God's word is what empowers us to be the kind of people he wants us to be. There's also an ungodly fear of circumstances. It says in Hebrews 2.14 that Satan um, keeps us captive or enslaved through the fear of death. 
In other words, because we're afraid of dying, he enslaves us essentially to his will. Right? It's interesting when you're afraid to die, it affects the decisions you make. And so these are some things to consider. There's nothing wrong with the feel, feeling of fear. It says in Psalm 103 that um, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He knows our frame. He knows that we're dust. And um, that he, he recognizes that we're weak. See, there's nothing wrong with being afraid. The, the question is, what do you do when that immediate emotion hits you? You have a choice. And, it, and see, because we've been trained our whole lives to live in fear by Satan and our circumstances and our own hearts, our go-to is to give in to that fear. Our go-to is to basically listen to our hearts. And essentially, that's what you hear on every pop song, and every movie, is listen to your heart. But God says in Proverbs, he who trusts in his heart is a fool. In other words, you want to find yourself living a foolish life, listen to yourself. <laughs> listen to yourself. How many of you ever found yourself in a position where you had to talk yourself out of <laughs> doing what you actually really wanted to do? Right? Right? Or better yet, you had to have someone else talk you out of it. Well, that's essentially what we're doing when it comes to fear. There's nothing wrong with the feeling of fear. There's nothing wrong, in a sense, to be tempted, right? Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, right? For God cannot be tempted, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each one is tempted uh, when he's enticed by his own desires. So in other words... Um, eventually, at some point, when you give in to that desire, then it becomes sin. And as you continue to give in to that sin, it brings death into your life. Um, perhaps, specifically, when it comes to addictions, physical death. Um, and also, just alienating yourself from the life source of God. And so, it's not sin to be tempted. But the question is, what do you do when you are tempted? You know, for example, uh, oftentimes I will take teams to the bluff in St. Joe uh, to share the gospel. And as you know, it's the bluff. We're right near the beach. And especially around the 4th of July, and of course the out-of-towners, as they come through, uh, they tend to not cover up once they come from the beach, right? And as I'm out there with my boys, um, and by the way, you should step out by our table when you get a chance and meet our boys. They're uh, quite fun. But uh, even as I take my 12-year-old out, and you have these young ladies walking by, not wearing what they should be wearing um, in public, you got a choice, right? I could go out and think to myself, well, I can't look, I can't look, I can't look, I can't look, I can't look. What am I focused on when I'm thinking that way? Yeah, I'm focused on what I shouldn't be looking at, and essentially, I'm wrapped up in my own head, right? That's essentially what's going on. Um, or I could even do what most people do. Well, I can't go out there. If I go out there, I'm going to fail, right? So you got a choice. You can either focus on what God wants you to do, or you can listen to your heart. See, the best way to shake that off is literally to shake it off and get busy doing what you're supposed to be doing. The same thing is true when it comes to fear. Fear, when, uh, when a circumstance is... Um, when circumstances come about that tempt us to fear, we have a choice. Um, we must obey in the midst of our fear. You know, our brother mentioned this passage um, in the general session. He was kind of dancing all over a bunch of scriptures I was going to use. But uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you can follow along. If you don't have one, that's fine. I'm going to read it to you anyways. But I just want to read a few verses by the Apostle Paul. Listen to how he describes how he was sharing the gospel with the Corinthians. Listen to how he describes himself, right? He says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. And although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and wisdom wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. So Paul says, look, I'm sharing this wonderful gospel with you. But when did he do it? He did it when he was in much fear and trembling. Was he sinning when he shared the gospel with them? Of course not. Could he have sinned when he was fearful and literally trembling before them? Do you see, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin necessarily to be fearful. It's what do you do when you are fearful? That determines whether or not it becomes sinful. You know, Mama didn't raise no fool. Uh, of course, Paul <laughs> wasn't stupid when he uh, traveled. He recognized people could rob him. <laughs> it's not like he said, please come over here and rob me. You know, he took precautions. But he didn't let that determine whether or not he was going to obey God in giving someone the gospel. And the same thing is true for you and I. We can't let um, fear determine what we do. It is sin to let your feelings determine your obedience. Let me say that again. It is sin to let your feelings determine your obedience to God. You know, as I mentioned, he who trusts in his heart is a fool. We walk by faith, not by sight. You know, in Psalm 15, God says that the person who dwells on his holy mount is the one who's a man of integrity, a man who does righteousness, swears to his own hurt. And one of the things he specifically sneaks in there, someone who speaks truth in his heart. You've got to come to a point in your life where you're going to let God's word tell you what to do rather than letting your heart determine whether or not you'll listen to what God's word says to do. In other words, are you going to listen to God's voice or your own heart? So how do you get over the fear of sharing the gospel? Well, you got to believe what Proverbs 29, 25 says. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. So instead of saying, well, I'm too scared to do this, because if you say that, you're basically entrapping yourself. You're basically enslaving yourself to yourself. You've made yourself your own God. You've determined what you will do when you will do it. Rather than trusting in the Lord and allowing him to exalt you in his due time. Do you see? You have an opportunity to worship God or to worship yourself. So how do you do it? You just do it. You believe what God's word says, and you step out as if it's true. <laughs> or you can shrink back and believe that it's not true. So you got to come to a point in your life where you will interpret circumstances of life based on what God has already said in his word, rather than interpreting God's word based on your circumstances. See, this is, this is very important to understand. Because if you're waiting for God to zap you with courage, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, you know, I hear people say something like this. Well, I didn't have God's peace about it. I wanted God to show me before I stepped out. But every time you see in the scriptures... God commands them to step out, and as they stepped out, then God gave them the courage and the power and the faith to do what he wanted them to do. If you're waiting for God to change your heart and then let you do it, you're not believing that God will change your heart, right? You got to step out and trust that he heard you when you prayed in the first place. You got to step out and believe that he will exalt those who trust in him. Um, 
There's so much more to be said about what I'm talking about. And I'm just glossing over this at this point. You have to choose to serve Christ instead of man. I'm not saying that we don't serve people. I'm not saying that we don't um, encourage people and make ourselves available to them. But you got to get the source right. Listen to this. It says in Galatians chapter 1. Perhaps you're familiar with this. This is another good passage I would encourage you to memorize. In Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Listen to this. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. Now specifically verse 10. This is the verse I encourage you to memorize. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see that? You can't serve two masters. And by the way, when we're seeking to serve someone else rather than Christ, we're not really seeking to serve them, right? We want them to respond to us the way we want them to respond to us. So who are we really serving? We're serving ourselves. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, um, 15, And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. If you believe that Jesus died for you and rose again, God set you free so you don't have to live for yourself anymore. And I don't know about you, but when I found out I didn't have to live for myself anymore, like I could be set free to serve God, It radically changed my life. Now, I want to take a moment, and I want to clarify something. We keep talking about the gospel, right? We keep talking that we need to be sharing the gospel. I think it's important that we reiterate what the gospel is. The gospel is simply this. There is one true God. He is holy. He's pure. He's good. He's never done anything wrong. He's different from anything and everyone that you and I know. And he created you and I in his image to know him and to have a relationship with him. But the Bible says all of us have sinned against him and fallen short of his glory. God says, be holy for I am holy, but we're not holy. We've sinned against him by breaking his law. He says, don't lie, we lie. He says, don't steal, we steal. And because of that, we owe death for our sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That means our sin separates us from God. And if we die separated from God, We'll spend forever separated from God in a real place called the lake of fire, which is the second death. That same verse, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even though we owe death, even though we've shaken our fist at God our whole lives, God sent his son to live a perfect life for us. God became a man. His name is Jesus. He never sinned not one time. He kept the law that you and I break. And then when he was nailed to the cross, he took your sins and my sins and placed it upon himself. He was separated from his father as if he lied every lie you and I have ever lied. As if he looked at everything we shouldn't have been looking at on the internet. As if he was the one who was unfaithful. As if he was the one who was shaking his fist at God, even though he never did anything wrong. And he willingly took your punishment and my punishment. He died our death for us. He was buried in a tomb, and three days later, he rose from the grave. So that now, if we turn from our sin and trust that Christ died for our sins, if we believe that he lived a perfect life for us, even though we can't, if we believe that what he did was enough for us on the cross, enough for God to accept us, God will accept you right here, right now, and forever. His punishment, that, that the punishment we deserve, Christ died. 
And he sets us free from being a slave to sin. He gives us a new heart, changes us on the inside. So check this out. The very thing that you and I are afraid of that keeps us from telling others about the best news ever is the very thing that was already dealt with. Do you realize the worst thing that could ever happen to you already happened to Jesus on your behalf? Do you realize that Jesus publicly displayed his victory over, your, uh, over sin and death when he was on the cross? That means the worst thing that could ever be said about you was already taken care of on the cross. So that means you have the courage to face your sin square in the eye and be able to overcome that by God's grace. In other words, there's nothing that should hold you back from being able to tell someone else about what Jesus has done for them. Think about it. If Jesus took care of our sin, what can man do to us? Now, there are more... You realize the scriptures say that the wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. How many of you are afraid of what already happened yesterday? No, it's already done and over with. You realize that God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he has everything planned and mapped out. Everything is already pretty much done in God's mind. He's just working it out according to his plan. It's a yawner to God. And you know what? We are God's child. If we know Christ as our Savior, if we're born again, God has it all taken care of already. We're just living, going through the motions of what he has for us by God's grace as we walk in obedience to him. And so it's silly to be afraid of things that won't even happen. You don't know if they're going to blow your face off. You don't know if your wife is going to uh, tell you she doesn't want to hear from you again. You don't know for a fact that they're going to reject the gospel every single time you tell them. Just like you don't know for a fact they're going to believe the first time you tell them. You don't know those things. But when you try to act as if you do know, what are you trying to act like? You're trying to act like your God. Like you have this under your thumb. God already has it under his thumb. God has good works prepared for you in advance to do. Because God is faithful and because God is loving and because God is kind. Remember Jacob, right? <laughs> he was so scared of Esau. He, he started sending all the, the women right ahead of him. He said, here, maybe they'll pick you out first. I like you a little better. They'll take, you know, he sends this whole caravan with all these gifts, right? He doesn't even know what's going to go down. Then he gets there and what happens? Esau starts weeping, right? And they're reconciled. That's how we act, right? Oh, you mean I got to go tell my, my brother about this? Oh, no, if I do that, oh, it's going to be so bad again, right? We don't know. We don't know what God's spirit is going to do. It blows, it, you know, just like the wind blows wherever it wishes. God can save whoever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. And he's chosen to use the method, method of hearing the gospel message. They're not going to believe unless they hear. Now, so far you're like, okay, this is okay. But uh, I want to get into the nitty gritty. All right, we're getting there. You need to begin training your thoughts to respond differently to fear. When fear comes upon you, it's basically a moment-by-moment -moment decision to obey God. Each time you choose this day whom you're going to serve, each time this moment you choose to obey God, you're training yourself to think biblically rather than selfishly. Yes, Um, maybe at the end, if that's okay. Sure, that'd be great. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to... Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, you want to... Each time fear comes upon you, you have an opportunity to obey God. And fear is an opportunity to worship God. So here are some practical suggestions I have for you. I would encourage you, instead of trying to be God, rethink and meditate on who God is. Begin to memorize verses or meditate on specific attributes of God. 
You know, God says that he's the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for him? How much sense does it make to be afraid of what man will say or do to you? Okay? Follow with me in Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. And we're going to look at Isaiah 40. And we're going to begin in Isaiah 40, verse 12. Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 12, it reads as follows. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? And marked off the heavens with a span. Enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure. And weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. So basically he's saying that he holds all the waters in his hand. It says that he's calculated the dust of the earth. He's weighed the mountains. He knows how much they weigh. Verse 13. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are the beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare him with? An idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for uh, silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will, not, will rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who, is, he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers." Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Do you realize the king that you serve? The nations are nothing to him. They're like a drop in a bucket. And you're afraid of what one person might say or do to you? God is much bigger than anything on this planet. I also encourage you to meditate on the gospel, like I already told you. The worst thing that could happen to you already happened to Jesus on your behalf on the cross. I encourage you to meditate on the attributes of God. I encourage you to meditate on the gospel. Now, this is where we're getting into the nitty-gritty. There's only one thing that will throw fear away from you. Anybody know what that is? Faith. Anyone else? Let me put it this way. There's only one thing that casts out fear. Anybody know what that is? The perfect love, right? Perfect love casts out fear. But he who fears uh, judgment has not been perfected in him in love. In other words... To the degree that you are afraid of what they will say or do to you, um, and that determines whether or not you give them the gospel, determines how much, whether, how much you love God and them more than yourself. That's essentially the deal. Each time you shrink back in fear, you're choosing to love yourself more than them. Each time you shrink back in fear, you're choosing to love yourself Instead of God. That's the bottom line. And God loved the world. He loved the world so much that he gave his son. There's no reason to shrink back in fear if God has your back already. You know, as I've been sharing with you uh, this entire time, none of you have asked me about my wallet. I'm really offended right now. I, I don't understand. 
I mean, it's a nice wallet. I got it for Christmas one year. It's getting damaged pretty good because mostly I have receipts and some other things people give me, business cards and such. Uh, but, you know, it's a pretty nice wallet. But none of you have asked me about my wallet. What is your problem? What's your deal? Well, that would be silly for me to really act like that, right? Why? Am I here about my wallet? Am I offering my wallet? Well, you know, when we share the gospel, we say, well, they rejected me. Or they're afraid of someone rejecting them. Well, that's silly. You're not offering yourself. You're offering a relationship with God. You find yourself shrinking back in fear because you think they're going to reject you. You need to get your heart right. You're not there to give them you. You're there to give them Christ. Of course, in the process, your heart goes out for them. Of course, in the process, you're willing to lay your life down for them. But what I'm saying is, you're not there to offer yourself. If you are there to offer yourself, you might need to get a different profession. Certain states, it's still illegal. So you want to make sure that you're offering the gospel. It says in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So you've got to learn to love God in them more than yourself. You know, it says in Jeremiah 1, God says to Jeremiah, he says, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed before them. Because if you are, I will dismay you before them. <laughs> Have you ever been looking crazy and foolish because you were so scared? Yeah, that's exactly what happens when we shrink back and we don't share the gospel with somebody. We're looking foolish before God and the angels that are watching. Not to mention the people we're talking to. I remember um, I was in Times Square in New York City. I was a little nervous. I don't know what my problem was that day. But for some reason, I happen upon these three burly fellas. Um, and as I begin to talk to them, I find out that they're uh, tipping some brewskis back as I'm talking to them. I'm like, oh, yeah, I didn't notice that until because I was so nervous. Why? I was wrapped up in my own head. So I get to talking to them. I'm going through the gospel, and I'm talking about, you know, the scriptures say don't commit adultery. Have you ever committed adultery? And they were like, um, you know, have you ever cheated on your wife? And I was like, no. And they're like, and I was like, and I talked about how l lusting for a woman, you know, in your heart is committed. Have you ever done that? And I was like, no. And then I was like, okay, that was a lie. <laughs> I, I had to eat crow, right? I was looking foolish because I was so afraid of what they thought of me rather than being more concerned about what God thinks of me and what God thinks of them. Remember 2 Timothy 4? He says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead uh, at, his um, at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, right? God is our audience. And we'll give an account for every word that comes out of our mouth. And so you should be more concerned about what God thinks you will say than what others will think you will say. Not to mention, remember, he knows our du we're dust. And he has compassion on his children. God would much rather have you speak up for him rather than shrink back in fear. Let God use you. He can strike a straight blow with a crooked stick. Now, think about this. Okay, let's think about the worst thing that could happen. All right? You're sharing the gospel with somebody. What's the worst thing that can happen? Anybody? It's 3D. Kill you. They, they could kill you, right? Okay, they kill you. Joke's on them. The jig is up. You get to be with Jesus. What's the problem? <laughs> and if you got life insurance, I mean, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Anyways, no, seriously, you get to be with Jesus. You get to be free from this sinful nature completely. You get to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we're not really afraid of that per se, unless we're not born again. We don't know where we're going. But... If we know where we're going, the next worst thing is, okay, they beat you down pretty good. Well, what did the apostles do? They went away rejoicing to be able to suffer for his name. Or what, what if they say something smart to you or whatever? I've had that a few different times in my life. <laughs> Usually I don't say something smart back. <laughs> I can't always promise that's the case. But um, even in the midst of that, you're getting a taste of what it means as an opportunity to worship God. Could you imagine to be standing before the throne of Christ as he's giving rewards to his followers and because you essentially didn't steward 
steward the gifts and talents and time that God has given you. You have nothing to offer him. You have no crown to lay at his feet because you wasted your time. Specifically, when God gives you an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, you have an opportunity to worship God by declaring his glory to the nations. What's holding you back? What's more important to you than God? What's more important to you than Christ? You and I can't save anybody. I'm not going to sit here and try to manipulate you and say, oh, man, they're going to burn in hell if it's not for you. Well, no, 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 no. If, if you won't open your mouth, the rocks will cry out. God will send someone else, and he will reward them for their obedience. God doesn't need us, but he delights in using us. The question is, do you delight in allowing God to use you? Um, now, you don't know their hearts, okay? You don't know what they're going to say. You don't know what they're going to do. You don't know the future, and you don't know them. And you're not offering yourself. These are all things I keep repeating throughout the seminar. I encourage you to go through these verses on your own time. But remember, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare. But he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Fear man or trust in the Lord. You're going to fear the one who can't breathe unless God gives them breath. Or are you going to fear the one that could... You, you realize what it says in Job? He doesn't have to um, take away our life. He has to just stop giving it. It's crazy. If he were to recall all breath back to him, everybody would perish. The God who holds our molecules together. <laughs> You're more concerned about what someone else is going to say or do to you? You see how silly it sounds? It, it sounds absurd. But when you live in this freedom... This not only frees you in the area of evangelism, this fear frees you in the area of leading your wife, your children. You're able to go past your failures and weaknesses and recognize God can use you essentially in spite of you. Um, because God is faithful to his word and faithful to his promises. You know, as you can see there, I recommend a couple books for you to check out when you get a chance. When People Are Big and God is Small by Ed Welch. It's a great book. I encourage you to check out when you get a chance. Very good, very comforting and encouraging. Really helps you to understand the issue of shame and among other things. Then there's also another book that might make you very depressed called Pleasing People, How Not to Be an Approval Junkie by Lou Priolo. It basically shows you just how prideful we are and how desperately we need to be humbled. And it will radically affect you. You'll see I have some contact information there. Perhaps your church would like to have some evangelism training. This is just a taste. There's so much more I'd love to share with you. Um, and more specifically, I'd love to take you out like you saw in the video. But um, basically, if I were to summarize what it is I do, it would essentially be this. Um, I'm here to help you witness. I'm here to help you open your mouth and declare the glory of the Lord to others. And what I want to do uh, at this time, I want to share a brief video with you, and uh, we'll close on at this point, okay? So I started out uh, a year ago when Aaron came to visit our church and do training for evangelism, and I was pretty confident in myself. I felt like I could do a pretty good job. Um, but the Lord humbled me pretty quickly. As soon as we hit the streets, my confidence in myself tanked. And God really showed me that I needed to rely on Him in order to accomplish anything in the open air. It's taught me everything uh, from the importance of prayer, praying for my team, for the people that I'm going to be talking to. It's taught me the importance of apologetics, the importance of memorizing scripture, the importance of reading scripture every day. Any spiritual Christian discipline you can think of, open air evangelism will test that to the extreme. Success does not equal winning people's uh, hearts necessarily. Success doesn't necessarily mean um, that someone is going to get saved, but rather a success is obedience. And that's exactly what Aaron helps and trains us to do. The first time I was, I was out, um, I, I, I was afraid. There was fear in me and there, was, there were doubts. 
I wanted to go out there and, and tell people about Jesus, but at the same time, I didn't. When I went out the first time, uh, I didn't believe that people wanted to hear about God. So I thought that they were just going to reject the gospel. But I found out that people are interested and they want to know who Jesus is. So they are willing to, to take a time and listen to what we have to say about Jesus. We learn to pray specifically for the people who were interested. Uh, people who were standing and listening and we learned to pray specifically for their salvation. So we were praying, you know, that God will touch their hearts and that we would be able to see uh, some of them come to Christ. So as we went on, you know, I noticed that people were, were stopping, they were listening and they were asking questions and that, that gave me confidence. I understood that God was with us he was listening to our prayers and that he was working. You know, one of the things I love about Aaron's ministry is that it pushes me out of my comfort zone. And you know, even as a pastor for me, um, to go out in the open air is a big deal. It confronts my fears and it, it encourages me to be bold and just to trust the Lord that he will use us as we're faithful to him. And so that's something that I so appreciate about, uh, about Aaron and his ministry. It also really encourages my faith to go out there and, and share the gospel message with people, to know that it's not uh, an accident, the time that they pass by. Um, to hear that message and to hear spiritual curiosity, it refreshes me and reminds me that God is still at work in people's lives and He'll use even me as I'm just faithful to be bold and to share that message for Him. Jesus can make you into the messenger that He's planned for you to become. Let us help you give the word to the people that you already know. Let us make you into the messenger that God wants you to be. We will meet you where you are and take you to where they are and watch God make you into the person he wants you to become. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to get into your word. We pray that you would uh, bless the food to our bodies. We thank you for it. Thank you for the hands that prepared it. And may we steward this time well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.